Hello, I'm Dr. Mikey Newborn, and this is Systematic Theology 2. Today, we're looking at the topic, the rapture of the church. Now, when you talk about the rapture of the church, it's important for us to see the different views. And so throughout this lesson, we're going to look at those views, and we're going to see what the Bible has to say about each one of them. And so this is going to be a good lesson for us. I know it's going to be beneficial in your study of eschatology. Good to be with you today. Let's begin our study. Hello and welcome to Systematic Theology 2. Today we're looking at the topic, the rapture of the church. Now this is an exciting lesson for all of us to look at, but it also can be very controversial. So when we talk about a topic like this, we always need to be careful. We always need to be people that are doing our best to know the Word of God, to study well, and to present our ideas or present our thoughts. But be careful and do it in a loving way, because ultimately no one knows what the end times is going to look like. We don't fully know what that will or how it'll play out. You can have the top theologians in the world. Now, they might claim some things, and they might even say, in my humble but most accurate opinion, they might say things like that. But ultimately, they don't know. And, and, and we don't know other than what the Word of God is telling us. And so as we look at this topic, I want to give you some thoughts about what the, uh, the doctrines are out there about the rapture of the church. Now, when we think about the rapture, it's the catching away of God's people in the air when Christ returns. It comes from the Latin words raptus, snatching away, 1 Thessalonians 4, Matthew 13, Mark 13. I want to give you a couple passages here that uh, that people use to teach about the rapture and, and help to understand a little bit more. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 1, now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him. Talking about the whole idea of, of gathering in God, bringing people together. Then we also see in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and 52, uh, it reads, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. Now, the teaching a lot of times here is, is, the, is the feast that goes along with the, the Jewish calendar and the feast of the trumpets and the trumpet will sound and all of that. And that kind of coincides with the idea of a rapture, people uh, being saved from a coming wrath or whatever you might put there. But, um, but, but these are some passages that will help you see either the word uh, for rapture or the idea of the church being gathered together. And so those are some of the passages, but we'll look at some others as we go. Now, what is the rapture? Um, it comes from the Greek word hapazo, which means to be caught up, snatching children up before the, the wrath comes. If you think about the word harpazo, we're thinking about a child who runs into the street. A child that runs into the street and a parent runs after them as they see a car coming. They snatch them up and they save them before the, before the um, really the, the danger comes together with the actual child, right, before the um, the car, the accident takes place. And so the picture there of being snatched up is kind of a similar idea of what happens with, uh, with Lot being snatched up out of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. We could say it's like Noah being snatched up out of the flood before it could, before it came. Um, and so that's the idea. It's, it's being taken out of that. And so of course, you can use illustrations about that, um, used from the Old Testament, but it's, it's that idea. That's where you, there. That's where this teaching is coming from. Word concepts: sudden strength, force, seize, snatch. Um, that's what's going on there. Key usages: the term appears over twenty times in the Greek New Testament. Here's several passages that speak about this. You see it in Paul's writings. Um, you also see in Hebrews, Revelation, John, Acts, Acts, uh, and then Matthew. And so it's, uh, it, it's a phrase that we know what it means. So since we know what the phrase means, it's important to look at um, this idea of it within the church, as the book of Thessalonians speaks about. Now, before we get into the actual passages that we're going to look at, I want you to see the different views of the rapture. Now, there's four here, and there might be others, but I want to give you the, the top four views of the rapture, but there's really five, because the, the fifth view would be there is no rapture. 
right? There's no rapture. That could be a view of the rapture. There's no rapture. But let me just give you um, the ones that are very common. And we've looked at these in the past. And I think it's good to look at them again. The post-tribulation view. Christ will come for his church during his return to earth after the tribulation. Then the, another view is the mid-tribulation. Um, Jesus coming back for his children. Christ will come for his church in the middle of the seven-year period of the tribulation. This is always an interesting view because, uh, along with the pre-trib view, because the mid-trib and the pre-trib seem to come, they're both before the major tribulation that's going to come, or the great tribulation, the second three and a half years that you read about, of course, in the book of Daniel. But um, it's important to to see this, uh, see this view as well. Then the partial rapture view, Christ will gather the spiritually qualified saints before the tribulation, while leaving the less spiritual ones to experience the tribulation. This view is, um, is not as popular as the other views. Uh, a lot of people you don't see a lot of people holding this view as much, but there's there's definitely some that do. And then the pre-tribulation view, Christ will come for his church before the seven years of tribulation. Now, there's another view that goes along with this teaching that you would say, okay, if the tribulation starts immediately after the rapture, and that's what some people believe, right? So if they if it starts right after the rapture and that begins the first year of the tribulation, then you really know that seven years, what that's all about and when it starts and all that. But if you say, well, no, that can't be when the rapture happens because there's other things that have to happen before that. So some people have, have a view that's years before the first year of the tribulation. And that's when the rapture of the church will actually take place. And so that's another view that you could put in there. So really, I've given you like six views here. Um, no rapture would be one of those. And then also the other one is before, like a pre-pre-trib view. So that'd be a, a good way to look at it there. Okay, so these are the main ones here that are in front of us and um, very important to know. Now, when we think about... The whole idea of understanding pre-tribulation view, it's always important to bring up uh, some of the most notable writing about this. Dispensationalism is one of those, one of those teachings. Periods or ages to which God has allotted distinct administrative principles, popularized by Jane Darby in the mid-19th century. The study notes in the Schofield Reference Bible, Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth, and the current best-selling Left Behind fiction series by Tim LaHaye. Um, picture of John Darby there, 1800 to 1882. The, this is what he wrote, or this is the teaching we have clearly about dispensationalism. Um Dispensation of grace or church age begins after the ascension of Christ on the day of Pentecost with salvation of Jewish people and quickly spread throughout the Gentile world and would, will be culminated with the rapture of the church. That's teaching there, understanding end times, and then dispensation of the kingdom age. Christ, Jesus Christ, returns to earth at his second coming to set up the millennial kingdom on earth. It will include the conversion and restoration of Israel, along with the ultimate fulfillment of the unconditional covenants made with the nation. Now, one of the interesting things that I found out about studying when studying dispensationalism was coming from the Messianic Jews, or sometimes we call them complete or whole Jews, the ones who believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And they have interesting takes on this. Of course, some of them believe in the rapture. Some of them don't necessarily. Some of them believe in a dispensational type of mindset. And they say, yeah, this makes sense. And you can see here the, how the Jews are appreciated and how the Jews are part of all that. While others really believe that dispensationalism is an attack on Judaism or it's an attack on Jews in general. It's, it's this idea that there's a separation between the church and the Jewish people and God's working that out through dispensationalism. But when you really look at dispensationalism, you can kind of see it from both ways. Yes, it could isolate the Jewish people and say um, they're going to have to fend for themselves during the seven years of tribulation. But the other side is saying, no, that's for the lost people. Those are for the people that rejected God. 
the Jews had more of an advantage than anybody. So if they had more of an advantage than anybody, seeing that we can clearly see in Romans chapter 3, well then what is the idea of dispensationalism saying? It's giving us the teaching, or you could look at it clearly like this, that uh, no, the Jews that are saved, they're going to be raptured at that time. And so there's two different thoughts processes that people look at when they're they're looking at dispensational teaching. So it's always important to do our homework and to study this the best that we possibly can because there are different biases out there, teachings, different understandings. And so um, so this is an interesting area for the pre-tribbers, the post-tribbers, mid-trib, partial trib, whatever, uh, rapture folks or no rapture folks, but also for the messianic Jews because they have a they have a lot to say on this topic as well and um, and so it's always important for us to know as much as we possibly can now the Bible tells us in first Thessalonians 4 13 15 and this is where you get a lot of the teaching about the future work of Christ and and the rapture but we do not want you to be uninformed brothers about those who are asleep that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. It goes on to say, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Of course, we're talking about the idea of being caught up, harpazo, grabbed up, snatched up, summoned by the Lord. And that's what you're seeing in that passage. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up, snatched up, our pots up. All right. Now, five aspects of the rapture. Return of Christ in the air, not to the earth. Resurrection, saints from Pentecost to the rapture. Rapture, living believers caught up into the Lord's presence without experiencing physical death. Reunion with the Lord and other saints. And then reassurance, comfort one another with these words, death is not the victor. And so we see five aspects of uh, that come with the understanding or the teaching of the rapture. And there's a lot of hope in the rapture. There's also a lot of motivation in the rapture as well. And so getting the word of God to people, um, evangelizing the lost, discipling those who are saved this is a big part of what we're called to do. But um, but it's 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 kind of a motivator if you want to put it that way, and awaiting. So it's people awaiting, eagerly awaiting the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is what people are looking forward to in this type of teaching. So this is important when you're understanding what the uh, what the rapture is all about. Now, I want to give you these different views and just break them down quickly. The reasons for its popularity. Church fathers agreed that this view was the most accurate. The pre-tribulation view was newer and not accepted as valid. The church will be preserved during the tribulation. People will be saved during the tribulation. So, you see, uh, you see some teachings there of why the post-trib view is so popular. The church fathers, this was their view, um, and they felt like it was the only view, the only acceptable one that's out there. The same words used for the Lord's return are also used for the second coming. This is a, this is a strong point. I've made this point in the past, but this is a very important one. The words used for the Lord's return are also used for the second coming. The tares are gathered out first in the parable in Matthew 25. Expressions like the day and the day of the Lord refer to one period in time, as it seems. Okay, now uh, the mid-trib view, reasons for popularity. The Great Tribulation happens during the second half of the seven-year period. So have three and a half years of, of a form of tribulation, and then it'll get into the, what we call the Great Tribulation. You see that in Daniel 9, 27. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week and for 
half of the week he shall put an end to the sacrifice and the offering and on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator the covenant with christ and the antichrist is a time of peace and then comes the abomination of desolation, and that's when the Antichrist will desecrate the temple area. He will he will completely come against Israel, and the idea of Israel running away, you know, um, getting away from this evil. And so that's what's going on there, right? Uh, and so this is where you this is where the, you get the teaching of the seven seven years, the first first uh, part of that, and then the second. All right. So that's what's going on there. And then the partial rapture view, reasons why people believe it. Believers are called to prepare for the end times. So it's a motivator for that. Good works are required to qualify for the rapture. Uh, another strong motivator. And 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Let us be looking. Let us be uh, awake when our Savior comes back. Let us, what that means is let us be righteous. Let us be godly. Let us have our minds and our hearts and, and our emotions set to the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Titus 2.13, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. First Timothy 4.8, henceforth, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. They're, these people are ready for Christ to come back. They're ready to be with him. And because of that, he is going to take him, them to be with him. And he's going to um, reward them. Free trip view. Christ comes for his own before the 70th week known as the tribulation, seen in Daniel. This theory agrees with the imminency of Christ's return. Christ could come at any moment. This theory agrees with God's program and covenants with the Jews and the Gentiles. The church does not endure the wrath of God in any scripture. I think this is probably the main point for the pre-trib view. Um, or the most popular main point, the one that's used the most often, is that the church will not endure the wrath of God because God's going to pour his wrath out on the world, on the, on the, on the earth. And people that espouse the preacher of view are saying God will not um, expose his children to that wrath. He saves his children. And of course, uh, the teaching about Noah and in the end days, it's similar to that, right? Is that the ones that were in the ark were, were protected from the, the wrath of God. And so the teaching there is those who are in Christ, they'll be protected from the wrath to come and, and they will be raptured out. Also, the Holy Spirit, the restrainer, is removed and sin is allowed to manifest itself without restraint during the tribulation. Well, if that was the case and Christians on the earth, there's nothing protecting the, the Christian, really, in a sense, right? Many apparent contrasts exist between the rapture and the second coming of Christ. Rapture, meet Christ in the air and go to heaven. After the tribulation, meet Christ on earth and remain on the earth. So that's what we see there, teaching uh, about the pre-trib view. I've shown, I believe I've shown you this slide before. Uh, it's... It's the dispensational, the pre-trib view, the um, after the church age, you see the resurrection of the saints. They go, uh, they're protected. They're in heaven with Christ. After seven literal years, they'll come back, and um, Christ will reign for the millennium. And uh, and then at the end of that, there's the um, white throne judgment. The evil are resurrected and sent to eternal state. And of course, those who are uh, already resurrected to be with Christ, the Christians that have been reigning with Christ or living during the millennium, those people will be in their eternal state as well. Okay, so this is kind of what's going on in the idea of the rapture. Now, I wanted to show you this, and I thought it was an interesting answer. What are your views on the rapture? This is Shema.com. These are Messianic Jews uh, that... Uh, they have a church, and they, they keep up with their, um, their website, and they post different things. 
anyways, I thought the answer was uh, was was good for us to kind of hear from a Messianic Jew. It is clear that there will be a unique seven-year period of trouble that precedes the return of the Messiah. It is also clear that those saints who are still alive when Yeshua descends from heaven will be caught up with those saints who have died, and all of us will meet the Lord in the air. I lean toward the position that this meeting in the air will occur before the seven-year period of trouble begins, but over the years, I find myself less concerned with when it will take place and more concerned that I am found faithful to the Lord, doing His work and fulfilling my responsibilities. Whenever He comes, I think a good attitude is to expect the Son of God to return soon, to pray that we will be spared the worst of the seven-year period of trouble, but also that we will be willing to suffer and even die if called upon to sanctify God's name. I think that's a, a, a great way to look at the rapture. I think some of us, we, we put so much emphasis on on the rapture or being taken up or being changed in that moment. And we forget that our focus should be Christ. It, it shouldn't be concerned with this uh, event on the timeline. It should really be concerned with the idea of have I been found faithful in, in my um, obedience to the Lord and my trust to the Lord. And so is that who I really am? And I think that's what this this writer is saying here with Shemadek.com. So this has been the Rapture of the Church. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson today. Good to be with you. Bye-bye. All right, that concludes our study today about the Rapture of the Church. What a fascinating study for us, isn't it? It's fun to look at ways that God is going to bring out his purposes in the future. We don't really know um, the exact timing of things. We don't even know exactly how it will play out. But the one thing that we know for sure is that Jesus Christ is coming back for his people. And so the timing is his and it's perfect. And so as we trust in him, as we focus on him, as we set our minds on Christ, we know that it will work out for our good. So good to be with you today. What a great topic for us to talk about. God bless you and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.